This lecture is going to be about the idea of universal gravitation, which is the idea that we want to be able to calculate the force of gravity and the acceleration of gravity anywhere in the universe, not just on Earth or on other specific planets. So, so far in physics, we've been using the equation for the force of gravity on planets. F is equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. And the acceleration of gravity, G, has always been given. On Earth, it's always 9.8. But we don't know where that came from, and we want to be able to calculate exactly how much gravity any one object is putting on any other object. So we're going to need new equations and new variables to go in those equations to predict that. These are the two equations that we're talking about today, and the variables are all written above my head. So we're going to go through them one at a time. I'm going to start by talking about the equation for the force of gravity between any two objects. The big idea here is that every single object with mass creates a force of gravity on all other objects with mass and the force always points toward the center of the other object. So I have a cart and a baseball, and if I leave them next to each other, they apply a force of gravity on each other. This is very counterintuitive, because we don't ever see the effects of this force of gravity, and the reason why is because the force of gravity that everyday objects put on each other is incredibly small, but it is still present, it's still there. And because of Newton's third law, the force of gravity object 1 creates on object 2 will always be equal in size and opposite in direction to the force of gravity object 2 creates on object 1. So those two things will always be the same, regardless of the size of the individual objects. This can be confusing because a lot of students assume that larger objects create larger forces of gravity on smaller objects. For example, if the moon is putting the same force of gravity on Earth that the Earth is putting on the moon, why is it that the moon orbits the Earth and not the other way around? And the answer is that because the Earth is much larger than the moon, it has a lot more mass. And because of Newton's second law, the object with less mass is more affected by the same force of gravity. So it's not that the moon and the Earth put different forces of gravity on each other, they put the exact same force on each other, as all objects do, on each other. The difference is not in the forces, it's in the masses of the objects. The more mass, the less you're affected by the same force. So now I'll give you an example of using the force of gravity equation. It's pretty simple on its own. To calculate the force of gravity, you need the distance between the centers of the objects. Here I'm going to imagine that that's 4 meters and the masses of the objects. I'm going to imagine that the card is 10 kilograms and the ball is 0.15. If you need to calculate the force between two objects, you're going to use the force of gravity equation, which is equal to capital G times m times m over r squared. I have the meaning of each variable listed above my head. You can see that capital G is a constant. We call that the gravitational constant. It's always equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newton meters squared over kilogram squared. This is constant everywhere in the universe, no matter which two objects you choose. This large g is always going to come into the force of gravity equation between them. And big M and little m just mean the two masses. It doesn't actually matter which mass goes into which one. It doesn't matter which order you multiply numbers. I'm just going to plug in the larger mass into the larger m, so I have 10 kilograms and 0.15 kilograms. And the distance between them is 4, which is r, so that's going to be 4 squared in the denominator, which is 16 meters squared. And when I calculate that out, I find that the force of gravity between these two objects is 6.25 times 10 to the negative 12 newtons. So that's 6 trillionths of a newton, which is incredibly small, which is why we don't normally observe that force of gravity. If there were no other forces acting on these objects, if they were just free floating in space, they would, over very long periods of time, start to move closer together because of that very small force of gravity. But here on Earth, where there are a lot of other forces constantly interfering with them, we don't really see that force. It's cancelled out by the much bigger forces. And I know that because that force of gravity is the same in both directions, the cart is experiencing the exact same force of attraction that the ball is. Let's do another example for force. This time I'm going to use a more realistic example of a normal experience of gravity, where we can calculate the force that Earth is putting on a person due to gravity, and the force that the person is putting back on Earth with gravity using that new equation. And you'll remember that we'd expect this force of gravity on the person, because they're on Earth, to be m times g. That's our normal equation for the force of gravity. I'm going to pretend that here the person is 50 kilograms, so we would expect the force of gravity to be 50 times 9.81, which is equal to 490.5 newtons. So we'll check and see if that new equation works and also gets us that same number. So for the new force of gravity equation, we need the mass of both objects. So Earth is the other object in this situation, creating that force of gravity. And if you look it up, Earth has a mass of 5.972 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And R, the distance between the two objects, this is actually a common misconception. When students are asked what is the distance between this person and the Earth, they're inclined to say zero because the person is standing on the Earth. But R here stands for the distance between the centers of the object, so you need to find the distance between the person and the center of the Earth. 
which is equal to the radius of the Earth. The radius of Earth is 6.371 times 10 to the 6 meters. So watch out for that. If you're calculating the force on something on the Earth, you don't want to say that the distance between that thing and Earth is zero. The distance is going to be between the thing and the center of the Earth. So now I have all the numbers I need. I just start to plug that into the force of gravity equation. And when I plug those in, I get 490.7 newtons. So just a little off, I might have made a rounding error here or there, but it's almost 100% accurate. So I can see that these two force equations both work for the force of gravity of something on Earth. But the special thing about the new equation is that this works for any two objects anywhere in the universe, any distance apart from each other. Another common mistake to watch out for is that problems will often say that an object is a certain height above a planet, and students will often mistake this height for the r in the force equation, but this is incorrect. r means the distance between the centers of both objects. So if you're given this height above the planet that the object is at, r is not equal to that height. The total distance between the two objects' centers is going to equal that height plus the radius of the planet. So the actual r that you'll use in that equation is the height above the planet plus the radius of the planet, because that's the true distance from the object to the center of the planet. So misconceptions don't come up too much in this part of the unit. Honestly, the place where students struggle the most is just actually plugging the math into their calculators correctly. So here, parentheses are going to be your friend. You should use parentheses very carefully in every single problem and use them a lot because if your calculator misreads anything, that's going to throw off your whole problem. And there are going to be a lot of very big numbers with scientific notation, so as long as you're using those parentheses correctly, you should be good. Please make sure to use those. Another trick to use, if you haven't before, is the double E symbol right here. When you press the EE button by pressing the second function button and then the comma button, your calculator inputs a single capital E. That capital E takes the place of 10 to the power of whatever you put next to it. So if I write 6.67e to the negative 11th, that's equal to 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11. You write the coefficient that you want, e, and then the exponent that you want, and that will be equal to coefficient times 10 raised to the power of that exponent. So that's a way that you can make scientific notation calculations easier on your calculator. Okay, that's it for the force equation. We can move on to the acceleration equation. The acceleration equation tells you the acceleration of gravity that any object will experience at a certain distance from another object. So the acceleration is written as lowercase g, which fits how we've been using lowercase g so far. Lowercase g has been the acceleration of gravity. And here, lowercase g is still the acceleration of gravity, just for any point and any object that we choose. And that's going to be equal to the same capital G times the mass creating the acceleration of gravity, not the mass experiencing it. So when we normally use lowercase g in previous units, that acceleration of gravity applied to any object on Earth, regardless of the specific mass of that object. All objects accelerate at the same rate of gravity. So the mass that you're going to put into this equation is always going to be the mass creating that gravity, in this case it's the Earth, rather than the mass experiencing the gravity. In our case, it was whatever we were dropping at the time. And r, again, is just the distance from the center of mass m to the point where you're measuring the field strengths. So the acceleration of gravity strength is also called the gravitational field strength at that point. That's another name for it. So looking at the picture above my head, you can see that any two objects, regardless of their mass, will experience the same acceleration of gravity, the same distance away from the center of the object. This is very commonly used in problems asking you to find the acceleration of objects above the Earth by a certain height. So if you were asked to calculate the acceleration of objects a certain height away from Earth, you would use the mass of the Earth as the thing that's creating the acceleration. And the object's distance from the center is going to be the radius of Earth plus the height above the Earth. So that is what you would put into R. And no matter where you look, as long as you're this far from Earth, all objects placed there will experience the same acceleration of gravity toward the center of the Earth always. So regardless of which object we place there, regardless of its mass, every single object will be accelerated by the same rate toward the Earth. One interesting implication of this is that if we give objects of different mass but at the same distance from the Earth, the same tangential velocity, they'll also have the same centripetal acceleration because they'll have the same acceleration of gravity. They could actually move in circular motion at the same rate around the Earth because they have the same acceleration, same tangential velocity, and same radius. So their mass doesn't determine how fast they go when they are in orbit around the Earth. And this actually holds true if you look at where satellites are around the Earth. As long as satellites are the same height above the Earth, they're going to move at the same rate regardless of their specific masses. So the only thing that determines your orbital velocity around the Earth is actually going to be your distance from the Earth, not your mass. So we can do another test just to make sure that this lowercase g makes sense and try to figure out what would be the acceleration of gravity of a person at the Earth's surface. So we would expect that to be 9.81 meters per second squared, 
and plugging this into our equation, we know that the mass of the Earth is 5.972 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, the radius is 6.371 times 10 to the 6th meters. Plugging this into our acceleration equation, we get this, which is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. So this equation explains where we get that value. You'll also notice that if we multiply the acceleration of gravity by mass, we actually get the force of gravity equation, which also fits our expectations because we know from previous units that the force of gravity is equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. So that is also always going to be true.